right now. Tom Parada joins me live in Studio Q. Hello. Hey, how are you? Well, I've been looking forward to talking to you because I, I got a chance to watch a, a couple of the first episodes of, of The Leftovers, and they've been swimming in my mind quite harrowingly. So I, 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 I'm interested in getting to talk to you about this. This is not the first time that a novel of yours has been adapted for the screen, but your, your previous works have been turned into feature films. How different has it been developing this into a TV series? Well, you know, it's a much freer, looser process, right? I think both Election and Little Children are pretty faithful as film adaptations go. And The Leftovers, uh, because we have 10 hours uh, to tell our story, we've created some new characters. There are episodes that use characters from the book, but um, tell entirely new stories. So uh, it's just a bigger world we've created. It feels like you're still writing the book. You're continuing yeah, to write the book. Yeah, it's a really interesting process in that sense. It's not so much translating the book, but, but building from the book. That must be strange. I mean, you, you write a book, you, you decide that you have an ending to it, and then to sort of open that up and re reclaim your creativity and, and continue it, as opposed to just adapting it, uh, must be um, challenging? It's, it's challenging. It's also kind of exhilarating um, because you're, you're making something new. I mean, it really feels um, as creative a process as, as writing a novel. And not that adapting a film isn't, but I think in adapting from a feature film, you're really kind of sticking with what exists and trying to find a way to tell it in a different form. And here, I really do feel like we're creating something new. There are some people who would say, take it, do what you want with it. Uh, my book will be what it is. Pay me for using the uh, you know the creative uh, idea, but uh, go ahead and, and adapt it however you want to. I won't be involved. Why did you choose to be involved? Well, that's a, a very traditional novelist attitude, and I think it it emerges from that old hierarchy where you know literature was the high art and film was in some way a commercially corrupted art. You know, and I I, I just grew up loving film and TV and and never feeling like uh, there was something you know, lower or corrupted about that. I agree that there are commercial pressures that exist in film and TV that, that don't exist um, in the world of literary fiction, uh, but I, I still think art can be created. Or maybe you're just corrupted. Yeah, that's true, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, choose to, I choose to pretend otherwise. <laughs> the Leftovers begins with this dramatic premise I mentioned. It, uh, but but it, it deals with some heavy themes, how people deal with grief, mass tragedy, what what interested you most about this subject matter? Um, you know, it, it's interesting. I started wanting just to take the rapture seriously. You know, I had spent a lot of time thinking about evangelical Christianity and thinking about the just the myth of the rapture, and and it's something that's often uh, you know ridiculed. You, you saw like a satire, like this is the end, that came out this year. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of sophisticated, secular people sort of laughing at the the rubes who believe in biblical prophecy. Um, we should explain just for those that, that the rapture is is uh, a, you know part of evangelical Christian theology. It's it's a particular doctrine. Not every Christian believes it, but the idea is that the end times will begin with uh, the faithful Christians, living and dead, rising into the sky to join Jesus, and everyone else being left behind for a seven-year tribulation, uh, you know, plagues and illnesses and war, and it's your last chance to get on the right, right. side of, you know, heaven and hell. And, you know, for me, what I tried to do in this book was to take the rapture seriously and not get into a fight with Christianity, but to borrow this image um, and use it for an apocalyptic story that was... I think more unpredictable and disturbing than say what you get in the left behind mm -hmm. books, which is just really a novelization of prophecy. You know, you know, who's going to win. Um, and in this, I just tried to take the, the concept seriously. And what I discovered was that all my characters were grieving. They were all confused. Uh, science couldn't explain it. Religion couldn't explain it. There's a vacuum of meaning. And the book is really how ordinary people try to fill this vacuum of meaning. All, you, all your characters also frequently make reference to the date, the sudden depart. Uh, uh, it's called the, the sudden departure. The date of the sudden departure is October 14th, and they talk about October 14th, October 14th. It's, it's interesting to watch this 
in the context of living in the contemporary world that we've lived in, in the last two or three decades because the first thing it made me think of was 9-11 the way we that date just saying that date means so much means something to everyone in the world october 14th felt the same way in the leftovers is that intentional uh, yeah i think so and and you know the book also starts three years after october 14th happens and it's about the way that the world changes and doesn't change after an enormous event and that was something i was very aware of after 9-11 you know on the day after 9-11, we all just said very blithely, the world will never be the same again. Everything has changed. And in truth, five years later, if you look back at it, a lot had changed. And we'd started some wars and, um, you know, we had different security procedures in airports. But in some fundamental way, I think we hadn't changed. Or some people hadn't changed mm -hmm. and some people had. And that's really, I think, what The Leftovers explores is what is this process of absorbing a cataclysmic event into history? Um, what happens to those people who decide to plow forward with their lives and what happens to those people who say it's entirely new and we've got to recreate our lives from scratch. Tom, even if there are similarities with the sudden departure in The Leftovers and, and The Rapture, in, in The Leftovers it's not just the true believers that, that vanish. And there's a funny scene where a cable news station shows a series of photos of the departed, and they include celebrity chef uh, Anthony Bourdain, Gary Busey's in there, the Pope. <laughs> I mean, even with the serious tone of this story, there's an element of the absurd. Why was that important to you? Well, you know, I, I think celebrity culture exists because we live in this big world. We don't live in, I mean, we live in our own little towns and villages and neighborhoods, but we also live in a big world, and it's a kind of a shorthand, right? You show a bunch of people, you know, that what the bartender says is, I get the Pope because, you know, the, the previous Pope uh, disappeared. Um, but then Gary Busey, I don't understand that. And it's a shorthand for us. It was like uh, people who uh, seem very good or very religious disappear in this event. People who seem uh, somewhat absurd disappear in this event. There's no rhyme or reason for it. So it was a very a shorthand way to represent the randomness of this event. Salman Rushdie goes. But why in Bonnie particular did you choose those people? I mean, are these people you actually want to see vanish? Uh, that... No, not at all. No, in fact, and we don't know if Have it's Have you a... heard from, well, I guess that hasn't aired yet. <laughs> yeah, well, we might hear from them. No, it wasn't, a, it, it, the question was, is it a reward for goodness? Is it a punishment for sinfulness? Well, it seems to be all of these things mm. um, in the way that, you know, good people get sick and die young and bad people get sick and die young. It, it doesn't seem to be a reward or punishment. So it, it looked... It, the sudden departure looks to be a random process, and that throws off all the religious attempts to understand it. It is fascinating how people try to deal with the sudden departure, try to grapple with this. I mean, that's what that's the meat of what's in this in this story. And one of the characters in the series tries to make sense of the event by researching the personal histories of those who disappeared. Others faced with you know inexplicable loss of loved ones are drawn into new religious movements. What do you think it is about human nature that makes us want to impose order on seemingly random events? Uh, well, you know, that's, that's who we are. Um, I mean, to me, religion is always about uh, answering the unanswerable questions. And, you know, we were born into a fairly mature religious world in the sense that there were religious narratives that already existed and we can join them as a child and go through to our deaths and never really question the religious narrative that we were handed. Some of us do question it, some of us don't. Um, but I think what um, what's happening in The Leftovers is that the existing religious narratives can explain this event. And so people, their minds go cannot. into overdrive. Yeah, it cannot, right? The Christian rapture comes close, but it, in a way, is completely undermined by the sudden departure. Um, and so new groups start to spring up. And, and to me, it's almost as if the religious clock has gotten set back to zero. And what we're watching is how religions form on a ground level. I mean, I know you were raised Catholic, but you identify as skeptical or agnostic now. Mm -hmm. is, is The Leftovers an anti-religious story? I don't think so. I, I, to me... Um, it's about what a deeply human act it is to try and explain the unexplainable. And that, you know, rather than say religion is some code that's handed down, it also, at some point in human history, it's an act of improvisation, and it's a real response to the world in front of you. Mm. Um, you know, I'm very fascinated with the history of Mormonism, for example, because that's a religion that, or a branch of a religion that started up in very recent history. It's not, you know, a myth back from right. the days before we had printing presses and, and uh, you know, 
and you just see how ideas spread and catch on, and, and that, that's really fascinating to me. So uh, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not anti-religious at all. I'm fascinated by religion. How did working with Damon, Damon uh, Lindelof, right, uh, mm-hmm. of uh, Lost fame, he, he's the person you're collaborating with on bringing this to television. How did he, his involvement shape the story? Well, I think people who know the book um, and see the show will say, wow, <laughs> that got amped up. You know, it's a much more tense, dark, action-oriented story uh, on TV than it is in the book. And, and um, you know, Damon is just that kind of storyteller. And it, it was a really interesting collaboration in this sense. I think I, I think of myself as a realist and I, I'm a novelist. He is a TV writer who comes out of the world of comic books and, um, you know, loves So how do you feel about culture. it being amped up? Uh, I think it works in this, um, you know, in this format. I think I think a melancholy, meditative TV show can work, but I think um, a, an action-oriented TV show that um, also uh, provokes the viewer with challenging ideas will probably get a bigger audience. I hope it does. Mm-hmm. In an interview with Entertainment Weekly, uh, Damon Lindelof uh, uh, described the tone he envisioned for The Leftovers as, if Lost and Friday Night Lights had a baby and then that baby was severely neglected. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is, is that, you know, bad taste vision, uh, one that you, you two shared? Uh, well, I, I don't know about the neglecting of the baby. It, <laughs> I think that he's just being, a, he's expen- extending his metaphor there. I, I like the idea of a show that exists between those two poles, you know, Lost, which was um, a, a, a story where anything could happen, including, you know, smoke monsters and polar bears on a tropical island, um, and Friday Night Lights, which was a real slice of life in an American small town that was about, um, you know, dramas like, uh, you know, who falls in love with whom, is this marriage going to survive, uh, is this kid going to get a scholarship, you know, I, I, that's sort of my end of the story, and Damon's end of the story is the the lost end. And so I hope we're kind of, you know, there's a, a tension in there that um, creates something that, that feels kind of new. Like Lost, the drama in The Leftovers is driven by deeply mysterious events. And, and you know that many fo- fans of Lost were frustrated by the show's finale and, and, and the explanations of the story, or lack thereof, I should say. Can viewers anticipate that their questions about the nature of the sudden departure will be answered, or, or do you see that uncertainty as key to the story over 10 episodes? I, you know, I, I always say that um, The Leftovers is about how people live with with mystery and with unanswerable questions. And I understand, you know, one reason we tell stories is to have endings and to give people reassuring endings. And so the people who want answers and want reassuring answers will be frustrated with the leftovers, but that will make them very much akin to the characters. You know, the characters are trying to make sense of a world that isn't offering them any answers. And so they start to create their own answers. And that to me really is the the process of the story. So, and it's not like we have a main character who's a scientist investigating the sudden departure and and who's prom, we're not making an implicit promise that we're going to explain this event. In fact, we're saying, how do you build a life when you can't explain the most important event that's happened to you. You talked quite generously earlier about how um, you don't take a pretentious position as a novelist or, of, of somehow being ele- elevated beyond television and, and film. Uh, at the same time, this has been a very popular book, and um, I, I wonder if, if how you'll feel if people only know The Leftovers as a TV series. Would you prefer they read the book? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> oh, I would. I would love for people to read the book, and I feel like that is my vision of the leftovers. Every word of it is mine, and the show is a collaborative effort, and it's it's something new. And but I have no doubt that it's good. That uh, you know, many many more people will will watch the show. To this day, you know. Thanks for your candor. Oh, yeah. I, I, the, I, <laughs> I, I was expecting something diplomatic, like oh well, whatever. If they want to watch, you know, I'm cool with it. Yeah. <laughs> You're like no. Read the book, people. For God's sake, it's the... Well, you know, I, I still get people who say, who are surprised that, to know that Election was a movie before, uh, a book before right. it was a movie. Yeah, right. And, you know, that hurts my feelings a little bit. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, it's a good. It's a great movie too. Oh, it is. It's, it's great. I know. Uh, it's an okay book. It's a really interesting series. I, I have uh, the sense. Uh, um, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the first to say this. That this is going to be a, a very popular and capture people's imagination. Congratulations on it, and thank you for being here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Pleasure John. to have thank you here. You.